Thank you very much. And it is a real pleasure um, to see uh, some very old friends here, um, uh, but also lots of new people. I notice everything's kind of moved on, which is great. Um, and I'm not sure I'm going to come up to that billing of defining all of the questions here. That's not going to, I'm not going to be able to achieve that. But I hope at least to give you some overview, um, really now as a perspective of the user of this information. So these are the things I wanted to touch upon. Um, the impact of ENCODE data on understanding human biology, basic biology, common disease and cancer. Um, quite deliberately, I left out rare disease. I think that's something that we should discuss. I don't think it has at the moment made a big impact on rare disease. I think it could do in the future, but I don't think it has at the moment. Um, I have a kind of theme on how the data is used and then what we need to think about or how to frame how we think about the next decade. Um, Mike Pazin and Mike Cherry deserve a huge amount of credit for this wonderful site on the ENCODE website that is collating other people's use of ENCODE data, characterizing it, and subsetting it. I had a very enjoyable um, uh, sort of four or five hours browsing around this. Uh, in this, I encourage you to go there and look at this um, so you can subset by uh, all sorts of things, basic biology, all these different categories, publication year, journal. It allows you to really zoom in and understand um, how people use uh, ENCODE data. I just got, I'm just going to pull out some figures. One of them is from that browsing around. Um, I can't actually remember the paper. It was a PLOS genetics paper. Um, and uh, I think this is about replication um, origins. And they were doing it in CAFE 562. And then they were able to just dip into the huge amount of data on this cell line to blend their data with ENCODE data across this. I think it's quite hard to imagine this group deciding to generate all of those data sets um, just for the hell of it uh, or, or to explore this. And so they're able to explore all sorts of different things. This next example is an example from common disease. This is from my colleague Jeff Barrett at the Sanger. Um, uh, Institute, you could have chosen many, many, many different um, figures that tell the same picture. Jeff's one of the leading experts on Crohn's disease, and he has spent a lot of effort in getting fine mapping uh, down uh, to the last couple of variants, which statistically is incredibly hard work. Uh, what Jeff is plotting, or Jeff's postdoc is plotting here, is the posterior probability of, I don't know if one of these things is a laser pointer, do they? Oh, no, that was a mistake. Okay. Middle. Middle. Okay, big thing. Okay. Uh, on the x-axis, uh, this, uh, this is increasing certainty that this variant is the functional variant. So this is the variance where there's only one variant that really explains the signal, and this is where it's much more diffuse signal. And then what's being plotted here is the enrichment, in this case, of M H3K4 ME1 in immune cells, particularly the T cells. And in this case of H3K27 acetylation in gut cells. Now, what's interesting here is two things. One is this recapitulates a well understood part of Crohn's biology, which indeed is about an immune system interrelated with the gut. No surprise there, but very reassuring to see. And for the variants which are here, you immediately suggest that their function is in T cells. For the variants which come in this group, you immediately suggest the function of those variants in gut cells. So you know the cell line that you should go and do your experiments in next. And that is a big win uh, for the downstream biology. The final thing, if you notice, is that it's not the case that the immune cells have enrichment in H3K27 acetylation at the same level. They're very much H3K4 monomethylation, and vice versa, H3K27 acetylation is something with gut. Now, I think that tells you something that Crohn's is different in how its genetics works in the immune cells versus the gut cells. And that's very interesting, again, in itself. There's something about the setup of these cells that means that the fine mapping for the, in the loci involved in gut is really seeing a different enrichment and a different histone modification. Um, and I'm sorry you can't see this at the bottom. This is actually work um, by my postdoc, Sandra Mogunella, in cancer. This is breast cancer. It was quite a delight, actually, as my postdoc, I said, oh, you should go off and download the ENCODE data from MCF7 and go and have a play and combine 
a lot of somatic variants that were getting genome-wide in breast cancer with ENCODE data. And I had to give him a small crash course in ENCODE, but in fact the website was very manageable uh, uh, for him. And I won't bore you too much on this. This is actually using replication timing, so the RepliSeq experiments. Um, later on, we also use, use histone modifications, and these are different types of mutations, and the key thing here is that we're seeing very, very different behaviors of different types of mutations relative to the replication timing. This is at some level understood previously, but not at this detail. So I want to use that example because it's an example that I really understand. There's simply no way that we would have gone off and asked our collaborators to generate the amount of data on any breast cancer cell line that we got from MCF7. MCF7 is not a perfect fit to breast cancer, but it's good enough. It gave us signal. So it would be better, obviously, if we did these experiments precisely on the breast cancers that we are studying for the mutations, but one has to make some compromises. And I'm particularly um, happy that we got some technically demanding data sets. So there are some annoying histone modifications, which I know is not, not the ones that are so easy to uh, chip, um, and I was so glad to see them in code. And for me, in this one in particular, RepliSeq, there's absolutely, you know, that would have been an incredible effort to try and set that up in our lab or our collaborator's lab uh, to run uh, and make work for us. So, so it totally lowered the barriers for exploration and discovery of a piece of interaction of cancer here with, you know, how and why do uh, particular cancer mutations arise at different frequencies in breast cancer. So I want to step back and ask, what is the use of this data? And both. Um, Eric and Elise pointed out that sort of ultimately it's very often about this hypothesis generation. But I want to split this out into three other areas as well as sort of general playing around with data. There are, I think, three other things which are very clear cut that people use this data when I browse through the ENCODE um, uh, publications. So one is, is as a design resource. So there's a bunch of experiments that happen further on, for example, promoter catcher high C, where you have to make choices about what you're going to look at. And you need a good way to assess how you're going to, which bits you're going to capture, when, where, and how. Um, and very often, I see people going and using particular ENCODE data sets or epigenome roadmap data sets. So it's not really an ENCODE feature. It's really this class of data, or IHEC data. This is not a ENCODE thing. It's this class of functional genomics. People using it as a background resource. We tested all other histone marks, but we found that this particular histone mark was the most associated, informative, or what have you. And that can only be done, really, when you have a catalog. And an interpretation resource for variation. The other thing which, which I've realized over time is that the cell context of ENCODE data is as, as important as its location on the genome. So going back to the uh, uh, GWAS association, the most interesting thing for some researchers is not that it's H3 acetylation or H3 monomethylation. It's that it's T cells or gut cells. That is really narrowing down the set of experiments that they want to do next. And so that cell context and keeping track of that cell context is incredibly important. Now these are technical details. But, and if Mike was here, I would be, Mike Cherry, I'd be congratulating him on his um, data coordination center. But it's also worth, um, I think it's a good exercise to go back and understand how people use this data. Actually, something I should have added to this is that the key, one of the key things is the data is open and easily downloadable. That is like a, a base zero uh, point that, that I often forget to state. Um, I think the number of people who work from absolutely raw data, i.e. the reads, is quite limited. But it's incredibly reassuring for everybody who sits just on the next layer that they could, if they needed to, go down to that level. Um, and that gives you sort of solidity in the system. However, the very first processing step, in other words, this sort of transformed signal, is very common. That is the thing that, for example, my postdoc picked up and used 
um, and I think many other people do. They don't work off necessarily the calls. They work off the first piece of, uh, of processing. And then there's the kind of calling elements, and I, I'm separating this out now into two sort of levels, the sort of calling experiment by experiment and the blended kind of things, which is, for example, segmentation. And segmentation has become extremely useful. People, I think, is almost a bit too useful in the sense that people are using it as if it's a truth, and it's not really a truth. It's a model of something very complicated that's going on underneath there, and, and it will change and evolve over time. But it's an incredibly useful way of collapsing a large, complicated data set down into, um, uh, a, uh, into a manageable way of thinking about chromatin in a particular cell type. Now I want to step back, and this is trying to put projects like ENCODE, Epigenome Roadmap, IHEC, all these other projects into context about what I think we need to, needs to happen over the next 10 years in the human genome arena. And I've come to feel that there's these three steps that we go through in building resources. And I actually sort of put the human genome up as one of these uh, right at the start as well. So to, to build a catalog, to classify, and then to curate. And I've given you some examples here in this table and about my feeling about where they are in this stage. And quite deliberately, there are things that haven't made it to the bottom right hand corner. In 10 years time, 20 years time, 50 years time, I'm not quite sure, everything should be in this kind of right hand corner where one is tidying up and, and controlling and looking at the details at some level. That's where we want to be. I want to encode, encode roadmap, IHEC is doing this, cataloging, or mainly doing this, cataloging in my view. This is what they mainly should do. And I just want to distinguish a catalog from aggregation, because it's quite, they, they look similar. Both of them are about putting a lot of data together that one can download and reuse and do other things. But there is a difference between building a catalog and aggregating uh, data sets. Um, and that's this, that it's comprehensive. So it's a, it's, it's, you've defined a goal to generate your catalog, and then you want to reach that. And there are these annoying, you know, biology is annoying, um, and so you can't finish the human genome through the centromeres, and you're going to have to make a goal that acknowledges that until a better piece of technology comes, comes around. You can't, we'll come down to this, get every cell context as a sort of definable thing, and so you're going to have to handle that in some way. But th these, I think, are the challenges to get over in still in the, the concept of comprehensive. So one aspect of comprehensive, which was a big thing back in 2002, and is just not a big thing at all these days, is that everything is genome-wide. We no longer debate that very seriously, and that's a good thing. We've got a bunch of countable things. I'm keen that every transcription factor gets measured. Um, it deserves it. Um, they're countable things. Um, uh, every transcription factor, uh, we should know where it bounds. Mike is slightly smiling and sighing uh, at that. Potentially every histone modification. But there's also these other, this other axis, um, quite what level of expression level you go down to. Um, this is a, there's an interesting debate to be had about what pieces of biochemistry are we interested in, in different cells? Because one could spend a lot of time measuring an awful lot of things even in just one cell. Um, and also, as I mentioned, these cell contacts, so cell type. But I think we do have to move away from just a static view of cells. And my own instinct is that there's going to be more in response, so that we're going to need to think about cells making decisions and cells responding to signals as much as we do is about their, what you might call ground state, whatever that means, because they're in some dish being stimulated, being um, uh, fed, or, or what have you. So we need to think uh, uh, about cell context, I think, in a broader way. So just going back to my, my three-step thing, catalog, classify, curate. I just want to talk about classification. This is sort of genomic science. This is trying to understand what is going on. And 
by necessity, this is just more anarchic. I just think it's fundamentally an anarchic process of people trying to understand why certain events happen, certain pieces of biochemistry happen in a particular way. And I want to put a particular note here about model organisms. I think there's absolutely no doubt for understanding human disease, we need the catalog in humans. But to understand the classification of events and to understand what is going on, we really don't care where we make that insight from. It is going to be valid. Sort of experience has told us that the insights that we make from everything from yeast and Arabidopsis up are very, very likely to play a major role in our understanding of human classification as well. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily that one has to build a catalog in every model organism or something like that. But I think it, it's bonkers not to leverage uh, model organisms um, in this space. And then I want to have a particular aspect about variation. I noticed that there's a number of projects, the GGR project and the FUNCVAR project and other projects, which sort of acknowledge this intersection between variation and functional behavior. But I think it's an area where arguably you have to go beyond classifying and towards a model. In other words, a model that says, if this variant occurs, this is what I think is going to happen. And you've got to make that model, you've got to instantiate that model, um, um, ultimately, mathematically. Uh, for this. And then, because it's so close to what I do, I just want to point out that it doesn't end after you catalog and you classify. You have to curate. And um, the human genome reference is sort of in a long term, um, but still it will not end curation mode. The human protein and NCR set, this is the, the U41 uh, grant with gen code. And I think we're getting close to the point where regulatory elements are going to go to that. There's a handful of known cases. I mean, classically, the, the SOX, the PAX6 mutations, and the Sonic Hedgehog mutations. Uh, the TERP promoter in cancer would be another established scenario where we really understand the relationship between a variant uh, and disease-causing um, behavior. But there are a number more that we've got to really um, uh, get to. This perhaps is not for this workshop. Um, but it's worth thinking about because I think it feeds into that end. The final thing I'd like to say is um, I have been blown away by the improvements in imaging over the last three years. Um, if you haven't, you've really got to fall in love with super resolution microscopy and also EM tomography. The ability to look at life at an atomic scale is remarkable, and it opens up completely new techniques. And for a genome biologist, it's like a completely new axis on this. Um, uh, and I think the future of the regulatory field, but in particular the chromatin structure field, has got to totally blend with this high-level uh, imaging. Um, so these are some pictures from my colleagues in Embel Heidelberg, this is actually DNA um, uh, spread out here. And the resolution one can get to is below 50 nanometers of individual molecules. Now, that means if you can do that at scale on cells, you can really start to see individual chromatin strands and, and work out where they are relative uh, to each other. So I know there's the 4G, 4D genome is precisely in this space. Um, but we need to make sure that those links are, are, are created. And I had a thank you slide, but it clearly didn't make it across, so I'm really sorry. I'd like to thank Mike uh, for that wonderful website. Um, uh, I talked with stuff from Jeff Barrett from the Sanger Institute. The uh, cancer data was Sandro Morganella with Serena Nick Zenial from Sanger. Um, and these pictures are from Jonas Rivas at uh, EMBL Heidelberg. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, indeed. Yeah. So I'm, I'm happy to take questions. I hope I've stimulated some. Carol. Thanks, Ewan. Um, I wanted to uh, ask you to follow up on the example you had of using the ENCODE data for the MCF 
cell mm -hmm. line, breast cancer cell line. So some of the other NHGRI and Common Fund programs we're going to hear about in a minute are also generating large-scale data for MCF, right? So the LINX perturbation okay. project. So can you comment a little bit on the challenges of integrating the data from these different scaled resources yeah. to drive a biologic? I mean, how would you pull in LINX data, for example, into the work your postdoc is doing yeah, on I, MCF? I, yeah. I mean, I mean, I think that challenge is not a challenge that is unique to this field. That is a challenge that is present across all of biology, which we're asking to, to integrate high-dimensional, multimodal data. So high-dimensional meaning we measure things with many, many different dimensions. Multimodal meaning we do it with two or three techniques where we, you know, it's not obvious how one combines those different modes. And I don't think there is a simple thing, way to do it. I think you have to understand the questions you want to ask, and then you need to have to have a skilled computational biologist, and they need to have a toolkit of data cleaning and then statistics. And frankly, the data cleaning is 90% of the drama, um, which is quite annoying. Uh, so that will go to data quality being very important uh, in this game. So that's where I think that, that goes towards. It's, but, but I think that... that um, that this problem is not a problem unique to this field. This problem is across all of, of, of um, molecular biology now. Aravinda? So, Ewan, there was, there was a very good, very good sort of overview. I'm wondering you're thinking on, on a, uh, maybe it's just one question, but first a comment which goes to the same question is, um, um, you, you mentioned, you know, the precision we can have when you narrow something down to a gut cell, for, but for those of us who study the gut, there's not one kind of cell. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the question is of resolution, so yeah, that's totally. what I want to bring up. That, um, you know, in the cases where in common disease studies, uh, we've been able to at least get an inkling of hypotheses like you show of the kind of histone marks. Even there, you know, there is statistical enrichment, but the enrichment is twofold, somewhere thereabouts. So, you know, that's about 10% of, of all the sites we know. Yeah. So the question is, how do we get to the others? You know, this, yeah. so is it just greater resolution in types or, uh, or what? Is it more perturbations? Uh, you have so, any ideas I mean, of? I mean, I mean, it's a good, well, they're both, they're, they're, you're absolutely right that, you know, it's, it's rare just to sort of focus this it's rare that the perfect experiment done on the perfect cell line with the perfect mark has been done beforehand. What, you, what you're doing is getting kind of close enough, yeah? So you're getting gut cell, but is it a, you know, a deep stem cell in the dividing gut or a mature cell halfway up or what have you? You know, that's the experiment that perhaps has to happen somewhere else. Perhaps it's better cataloging. And I do think, I mean, I think of this as a, as a matrix where at the end of the day you want to have enough information that you can reliably impute all the places where you don't have information. So maybe you don't do every histone mark in every cell, but you do enough histone marks in enough cells that you can get a model that you can then impute into all the other cells that you have some, some limited, more limited approach. It's viewing this whole problem in a very statistical mindset, but I, I don't think that's a bad way of thinking about that. But just, just to add to it, I, I think that's exactly the point, that one thing that you didn't emphasize, but you just did, which is this modeling part. How well are we explaining even gene expression, the gene expression that we measure? And so in some sense, the better you can do that with all of yeah, these elements. Absolutely. The, the, and and, and I, I, think, I think doing that better is, is a good thing, but I wouldn't dis... Well, I would be absolutely for just getting enough data sets that we dominate the problem, that the problem is stops being computation, well, stops being sophisticated computation and, and is, is instead much more a, a kind of, well, these are the data sets. So, you know, we have the option to generate data sets in a smart way to, to, to make that imputation work well for us. Paul? Ewan, so this is about aggregation and cataloging. 
So one, one of the uses for the ENCODE data has been that it's systematic and all in one yep. place and it's lovely and all that. But if we had an aggregation of all the other smaller scale project data of the same type, how, you know, how far would we have gotten? Okay, yeah. Right. So that's, that's, I mean, one can, answer the, one can answer that question in the sense that the aggregation of, um, of ChIP-seq happens as well. Most people do submit. The metadata does come in. So you can look at that. An incredibly interesting study, I thought, was done by Arvis Brasma a couple of years ago about looking at submitted microarray data sets. And microarrays was a technology where there wasn't a cataloging effort. If you remember, the Novartis Foundation did that thing. Everybody used the Novartis stuff, but there was lots of proposals to do more of a catalog, and then none of them came through. And what Alvis discovered is that most good experiments happened on blood. It's absolutely no surprise at all. Most good human experiments happened on blood. And I can totally understand why that happened. And then you got this kind of really annoying tail process to this. Um, and so I think there is something different between that aggregation and, and cataloging. Uh, and what that argues for me is that when you're cataloging, you've got to go to the, to the corners which are hard. Um, that's a really important part of the process. Uh, uh, so, Alvis's, Alvis's, um, the, the microarray experience is not a one-to-one -one mapping, but it's, um, it's an interesting data point, um, because in some sense it was a case where, where only aggregation happened. Yes, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Yes, imagination. I, I would agree. Sure. So, um, <laughs> I don't know your name. <laughs> Sorry. But, Bert Andrews. Brenda Andrews. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, I was surprised. Brenda, Brenda Andrews was saying that, um, uh, that it's important to um, take model systems and generate large amounts of data off them, even if you don't quite know or you don't, you don't have a clear-cut line of sight to the disease endpoint uh, from that. I would, I would totally agree with that, and, and I wanted to focus in that, that, this middle bit of classification, which is incredibly important. G generating data just by itself just d doesn't inherently give you insights. And, and my experience again and again is, in particular in model organisms, there's some sort of quite peculiarity of the organisms, but it, just, it, it is set up that X is an experiment that is very easy to do in this model organism, and then you go off and do it, and then suddenly you get some insight that's very often not even what you were planning to do in the first place um, uh, um, uh, around something. So I want to, I would, I would totally echo that, that feeling. Um, I don't think that detracts from the need of making a catalog in human at all. Yeah. Dana? Yeah. I just want to make, a, again, a comment regarding data quality, so you merged ENCODE and TCGA, and we've had a lot of experience with both of them, and ENCODE data is significantly higher quality than TCGA data in terms of amount of artifacts, reliability, cleanliness of being able to take it and, and use it in a significant way. And we also download often when we don't have the right tissue in ENCODE, because I'm a very big believer in context and tissue, and very often even in cancer, the same cancer, breast cancer, because of the copy number aberrations and all the rearrangements, then MCF7 really isn't relevant for another cancer. And I've seen huge variability. Yes, some aggregate people that do uh, different chip seek like analyses do it very high quality, and others put their data up there and you see like this dramatic drop. So it's all about data quality, uh, garbage in, garbage out, and that's, um, it's not enough to have it measured. It has to be measured right. Absolutely true. By the way, I would, I, one thing I would say, having now lived some of the cancer stuff, I just think cancer's like 
hard. Cancer variant calling, I, officially I've decided it's hard. I don't want to go down there. Yeah. Yes, you can say that to Daddy. I'm, I'm, I have a newfound respect for anybody who does that. Can you, and I would like to follow up on the comment from before when, when you uh, lightly said it's an immune cell and, and you got the comment already, immune cells are many yeah, yeah, different absolutely. variants. Also within one type, even if you're very stringent in, in the sorting, you will find an enormous variation yeah. across a, uh, say, 200 that, that we're doing at the moment, much more than you would have expected uh, intuitively. So I think it's an important point is to get away from standardized cells and cell lines to primary cells which are exposed to environmental cues uh, to yeah. metabolites and so on. So I think that's very important and I didn't see... Yeah, I, if, I'm sorry I didn't bring that out. When, mm. I, I, when I did say cell context, I did say, you know, we've got to go away from the static one, we've got to look at response. I should have, I should have also brought in single cell genomics as well. I mean, I totally, part of that response is that is to move away from a population view of response to a sort of single cell trajectory view of, of it. And I think that's, that's also incredibly well, important. Th that's one, but also the genetic variation and its influence and how it affects the epigenome is a very important one. So not that's just having, looking at 100 cells in a population, but looking at 100 different donors and look at the same cell type. That's also, that's that, absolutely. Aviv? So, could you elaborate a little bit about your thoughts around responses and stimulations? Uh, first of all, it increases just the dimensionality of the problem. Absolutely. Um, but also that, and, and by the same token, going into genetically variable individuals, be them from a model organism or for humans, and into primary cells and into cell types, which of the many different dimensions in which we could go after variation is, is going to be the most useful. Where's the sweet spot? Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I don't know that we, I agree, so um, that this is a complicated design area, basically. And I don't think we have enough strong data to tell us. One thing I do note is that I feel that the uh, GWAS hits for disease are not having as strong an overlap with the vanilla cis EQTLs that are now coming out in the thousands uh, uh, for this. Would you disagree with that? They agree when you look at uh, cells that are being stimulated and when you look at primary cells that are relevant to the disease. Yes, so I think for my aspect, it's, I think the biggest amount of agreement is that stimulation or response um, aspect rather than necessarily the ground state. Uh, so, if I, if I had to kind of bet, I would be betting to looking for response, effectively decision making by the cells, and that's it's understandable to think that that variants that affect the balance of a decision are much more likely to be involved in a disease. But I think the short answer, Aviv, is that we don't have enough data to design to understand that those different dimensions. And what we've got to do is, is effectively, you know, make sensible designs now, but pause after a certain period of time and say, right, you know, what is really worth doing at what scale, at what level, now that we can, for example, do single cell genomics or epigenomics, you know, to what extent should you use that technology in which primary cell populations, and to what extent shouldn't you? I mean, I just don't think we have enough information to, to know what, where that, trade-off point is. And that trade-off point will be very dependent as well on cost. So technology comes into the, the mix here as well. So, so I have one follow-up question also to the, uh, I think, Arvinda and someone else who asked over there. Um, and it also relates, I think, to what Dana contrasted between ENCODE that was mostly done on cells and TCJ, which is done on tissues. You know, God forbid, also cancer. Well, I which think is, the big difference is uh, but, but, style but the, but, but, the, but the question is, Tissues versus cells. Yes. What, well, homogeneous cells? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. But tissues, I mean the blob, you know, the real physical... I don't think there's an easy... Do you think there's an easy answer to that? No, that's why I get to ask. <laughs> okay. I, th I think you've got to be data-driven and, 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 and make a good justification in each scenario. I note with interest 
in Drosophila, people happily chip seek the entire embryo and get good stuff out of it. And, um, and you know, it kind of slightly makes it, I'm like, whoa, what happened there? Um, uh, but that is slightly about, um, you know, designing your experiments such that you know you can deal with the interpretation afterwards, um, that it's a mixed, a mixed cell population. I don't think that's an easy answer. I'm sorry about that. Jay, you look like you want to ask a question. Okay, Mike. Maybe just comment on that further. I'm, this gets wrestled with all the time, and uh, I always look at the metagenomics field where you can sequence, you know, an incredibly complex mixture of, you know, bacterial samples, and you actually still can extract a lot of information, even though we don't always know what all the bacteria are in there. Uh, so it gives you some level of information, but, um, and having the individual species is obviously incredibly useful too. So it, it's another, it's two dimensions basically. It's the whole complex mixture. I mean, anytime we've wrestled with this a lot in ENCODE, when you start isolating cells, if you purify hepatocytes out of a liver, yeah, they're not exactly the same as yeah. hepatocytes in a liver. So you're always struggling with these things. Uh, and, it, you know, it's the nature of the beast. Just to touch on it, back to imaging here, I think imaging gives you an orthogonal modality for measuring things in cells. Um, and so a completely orthogonal modality. And sometimes that works better in vivo or close to vivo than the genomics technologies. And so I think there's going to be a lot of interesting play between, oh, I've taken this and I've also put it under a microscope and I've done this clever piece of labeling and la, 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 la. And now I can do that clever piece of labeling in a different context where I can't do the genomics, but that will give me insight into that other, that will help bridge those things. So that, I think imaging is another modality is, is very strong. Should also mention, by the way, I didn't bring this out, is cohort studies. It's another dimension that Hank brought out. Uh, that, and that's another goes to these functional studies. The extent to which cohorts think about molecular phenotyping, when they talk about molecular phenotyping, they'll go from RNA-seq into these sorts of chromatin measurements, but in blood cells, probably, because that's what you get a lot of in cohort studies. Um, and, the, and the interplay there is quite interesting. So just the accessibility of blood means that there'll be a lot of focus on that, that as a tissue. And um, you know, that, that's just the way life is. We, we, we're not going to get around that. Like I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering if, you know, obviously you're steeped into this as to where the technology is at, that when we do get tissues, which is a mixture of many different cell types, even cell types we may not normally recognize by the kinds of methods we use, is there some way where the long-range contiguity of epigenetic marks could be used to recover at least? Well, I mean, I'd, I'd turn this question to Aviv. Uh, you know, locally on, in our shop, Sarah Teichman, John Mariani, and Oliver Stagel has done great work in handling single cell readouts and working and deconvoluting. So let me just tell you about another problem with single cell is that, of course, you've got the cell cycle going on. So you've got to think about, I'm measuring things, and I know that cells are somewhere in the cell cycle. So you've, you've got quite a lot of things going on there. Um, but I, I, you know, I think, I think it's, it's quite manageable, actually. Um, the real problem is cost, um, to be honest. And I think the techniques for that are rapidly, the techniques are rapidly maturing and the costs are dropping. So, so we shouldn't leave. I should have had single cell as the other opportunity. And, and, and not just with sequencing. Um, there are techniques, for example, that Dana is a great expert in for looking at protein levels, which That's I think are going yeah. to matter a lot. Yeah. So just to weigh in on this difference between cell lines and purified individual cells, we, we work really only on primary immune cells, which are very highly purified by flow cytometry. But nevertheless, when we do experiments like, you know, looking at accessibility or gene expression or whatever on them, we find ourselves going back to the cell line uh, encode data sets for histone modifications and so on, just to identify those things that we can do again in the primary cells to give us a complete picture of what's going on so we don't have to do everything yeah. under the sun. So I, I think actually... The yeah, well, that, that goes to this kind of, you know, you've got these sort of hot spots where you can generate lots of data right. deep, and then you've got other places where you're going to explore another dimension, I, you know, doing this in a structured way. At least I feel this discussion has uh, has... 
reached its natural end. <laughs> and before we, before we just debate single, single cells versus tissues versus cell lines. So Ewan, before we let you off the hook, <laughs> Sorry? before okay. we let you off the hook, at the very beginning you mentioned something about uh, rare disease yes. as an opportunity. I wondered if you wanted to say a few words. I, I think, it, I don't, you know, I'd be interested in other people's view in the room, but I, I think the places where ENCODE data has made a big impact has been in common disease, particularly this association of your loci to different cell types and then helping you film that. And in cancer, um, it's, it's becoming just really important on whole genome data to understand. So certainly you just can't do it without having a good grasp of replication timing. Like we need to have replication timing on a very large number of cells. Otherwise, we really won't be able to make good decisions about cancer mutation recurrence rates. But with rare disease, I don't see so much systematic effort. And I now hand you over to my colleague uh, uh, over there. If you know, he can, he can tell me that I'm bonkers or, or, no, I mean, or on the money. I think you're right. The, there certainly hasn't been systematic effort done in this space yet, and it's for for a few different reasons. We we don't yet have large enough cohorts of rare disease patients with whole genome sequencing data where we can systematically look for these types of variation. I mean, it, I think with good reason we've gone after exome sequencing yeah. in these cohorts early because that is where the easy where the low hanging fruit is. Um, but that will change pretty rapidly over the you know over the next two to three years. There'll be large efforts, you know, NIH funded and elsewhere to do whole genome sequence on you know tens of thousands of rare disease mm -hmm. patients. And with that type of data, the only way we'll be able to make sense of that is by having much finer granularity on how we how we do functional aggregation of variants in non-coding regions and how we distinguish benign variation from, from deleterious noise, just as we do in protein coding regions. Yeah. And so data like ENCODE will be absolutely critical for the, you know, maybe 5 to 15 percent of rare disease patients where there is some non-coding cause that we have to untangle. And what do you think about modifiers as well? Because I think rare disease, you know, I think the other angle to rare disease is really thinking about every rare disease that's not actually Mendelian, but in fact oligogenetic and, and those modifiers. I think there's a big space there as well of getting at the, at the modifiers of penetrance and that sort of thing. Yeah, we've been so limited by sample size, and it's only where, as we start getting thousands of cases that we can start doing modifier yeah. searches yeah. with any robustness, but uh, it is exciting, yeah. Okay. Is there anything specific that could be generated, either a technique or a resource that would be impactful sort of and can be proceeding in parallel while cohorts and so on assemble? Or is it just a matter of just waiting for the samples? So can I respond to one aspect? I think for Mendelian disorders, all the sequencing that is done, including clinical sequencing of well-defined phenotypes for which heterogeneity is not in doubt, CF, for example, there's a small percentage of patients that don't have CFTR coding mutations. Okay. Now, classically, people have waved their hands because even the sequencing wasn't done comprehensively of the, of the coding exons. But now there are numbers of people yeah. who've done this. So I think you don't necessarily, I understand what Daniel is trying to say, that would be great, but there are defined disorders, overwhelmingly single gene, even if there are few loci for which there are coding mutations that are not known. And I think they would be a great place to begin. I, 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 I believe that there is this myth that all non-coding variants have very small effects, which is why yeah, yeah. they're not I, I, I mean, I, I, would, I, I think that myth is to be challenged um, as well, and I think those would be very interesting. But I, what I would agree with, Daniel, is that we've got a train coming at us, which is the UK 100,000 genomes, the whatever million, million genomes here, where a whole bunch of rare diseases are going to be sequenced across the entire genome. So, like it or lump it, we're going to have to have, a, 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 we're going to need to have analysis methods that get into this. Um, and uh, so, so, but, but those, these two viewpoints are not incompatible uh, and, at all. And, you know, and of course, I totally agree with Aravinda. There's, there's great cases where you can make headway. We have a, you know, a cohort of Duchenne muscular dystrophy patients where no coding mutation has been found. And, in, you know, in a number of those cases, we have been able to find non-coding non causes. Okay. So, that's a great cohort to go after. But for the, you know, for the vast majority of the rare diseases, it'll be harder. I'm going to mention a reference. There's a beautiful paper, Whedon et al., which is a perfect example of uh, this is in Nature Genetics from I think maybe a year and a half ago, where they use the, the, the ENCODE data set wasn't available. They didn't have pancreatic progenitors. And so they made their own enhancer map, which is effectively identical to what ENCODE would have done in that cell type, and used that to nail a, 
non-coding distal enhancer mutation, right? So I think there are anecdotal examples like that, right? And, and it sort of fits the model. If you just improve the resource, it will get, get used when the time comes. Great. Done? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.